Hello everyone, Brett Kelly here for another Tuesday Tech Tip here at 45 Drives. And uh, well, I guess today's not so much of a tech tip. Again, it's just more of a Tech Tuesday video. Uh, we, were, uh, we were lucky enough, me and my colleague Mitch, were lucky enough to uh, finally go attend the Cephalicon conference last week in Amsterdam. And uh, well, we just wanted to tell you guys about it. We met a lot of great people. Uh, the community was awesome. Uh, learned a lot of new stuff on what's happening in the future of Ceph and just the overall vibe of it was awesome. It was a great place to be. It was fun to be part of the community, put some faces to some, uh, to some names. And uh, well, let's get into it. I got a lot to talk about. So, Ceph Conference, Cephalicon. Uh, where do I start? I, I, I started to list, oh, here's, here's all the amazing things I saw, and, and, and then I scrapped it and just said, I'm going to get on camera and just talk about it. So, um, let's, let's, uh, what I'm going to do is just, I'm going to go off on a tear here and just share my thoughts on uh, what, the, what the week was like and uh, try to share some of the news that we, that we've, that we learned. Um, but let's start with the big blue elephant in the room. Uh, IBM. This was the first Ceph conference, in-person Ceph conference. They had Ceph days, but it's the first big like Cephalicon uh, conference since um, the IBM takeover. So for those unaware, uh, IBM had acquired Red Hat a couple years ago, a year ago. Sorry, I don't quite remember when, but they acquired Red Hat a bit ago. And then just somewhat recently, the Ceph development team moved from Red Hat into IBM. So Ceph um, direction really is kind of like an IBM thing now. And um, so the first thing that was kind of addressed in the, one of the big keynotes was uh, Danny Mace, the VP of software storage at IBM, um, kind of addressed this to everyone and said, uh, I'll keep it short. He pretty much just said, don't worry everyone, Ceph's staying open source forever. Um, what happened is when they joined in with Red Hat, they went and did that because they were big users of Kubernetes. So that's where the relationship started. They acquired, they merged in, and then they noticed the, where Ceph was going down the direction under Red Hat was very containerized and everything like that. And that didn't really jive with what IBM wanted to use Ceph for. And really, what I come to find out later, our opinion as well is not really the direction that the general public wanted it to go either. So that led the desire to pull it in because again, IBM is going to use it in their main uh, storage product, but they're going to leave it open so everyone else can benefit from it as well too. So uh, I guess I'll just say it. I was a little uh, uh, worried when the acquisition happened and I was a little worried too when the leadership changed, but everything that they've been saying since and after what I saw there, it's pretty clear to say that it's more like IBM kind of saved the direction of Ceph, where they took it back off that containerization, containerization road and, and uh, kept it very open and, and um, uh, for the people, if you will. So uh, good stuff there. So um, to summarize that kind of blurb up is IBM is keeping Ceph open source forever, in their words, and uh, they're focusing um, to be best in show in their three protocols, S3, NFS, and NVMe OF, which is, you can think of it as the iSCSI replacement, and um, an increased focus on uh, regression testing, beating the crap out of releases before they come out so we're not seeing any bugs, and um, just generally taking it back to that kind of bare metal, big, big cluster. So uh, good stuff there. Uh, another cool piece of news that was kind of officially, unofficially decided there uh, really gave a good taste of the way the open source community makes decisions. Um, the, the naming of the next Ceph release. Uh, I think the next big release coming out is called Reef, which meaning there needs to be an S release after that. Um, and it's going to be Squid, which is so very fitting for Cephalopod themed names. Um, I love it. Squidward would have been cool, but I think Squid's probably good, good for everyone. Um, it was funny to see too. I, I knew that that one was in the running just because I'm active on the mailing list or I actively read the mailing list, should I say. Um, uh, and then when we got there, someone just kind of brought it up in one of the talks 
And then someone else on the stage was like, oh, is that what we're going with? Okay, cool, cool. I just thought that was awesome. Like that kind of, it's such a huge, amazing product and just the way the community chooses to name things and pick stuff like that. It's so anti to that corporate of like, no, we let marketing name it and all that. It's just, it's clear that everyone got to really kind of put their, put their spin on it. So anyway, just it goes back to my other point too. It was really, really fun to just go and be part of the community, feel accepted and welcome there. We've been using that product and, 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 and seeing the names and the mailing list and the get commits forever now. And it was just cool to see the talks from the devs and just, I don't know, just be part of there. I was a little starstruck to tell you the truth. It was, it was really cool. Uh, so the next cool piece of news, more of a kind of a technical topic, um, the next generation of the OSD storage, uh, right? So originally there was file store OSDs. Now the, the default and go-to one is called Blue Store. And what's next is called Crimson OSD. And what Crimson is, is built for is to get the most out of NVMe. Um, right now, of course you can use NVMe in a Ceph cluster, but you do leave a little bit of the NVMe performance on the table. And that is limited to the Blue Store implementation, which really was built with hard drives in mind. Now that NVMe's are so goddamn fast, you, you can't be as uh, uh, loose with your CPU cycles. You gotta be a lot tighter and there's, there's a lot of performance to get pulled out of that. So what the team's been doing, uh, one of the teams over um, with the Ceph community, has been building Crimson OSD. And what that'll do is it'll, it'll be for fast devices like NVMe. So this was a, uh, a really cool topic a bunch, across a bunch of different talks. I didn't get to go to all of them. Um, but um, what, I guess what I wanna say here with this one too is like, you could feel the excitement around it because it is a big evolutionary change in Ceph. Um, and they're moving really fast on it. it, it it's, you know how you can take a really cool, I'm sure everyone's experienced this, where like having a new idea in the idea phase and then getting that into a working prototype is way harder than it seems. Because once you get in that working prototype and people start to use it, then whoa, it, it's great. But that breaking that from a, I have a cool idea to, oh, I have something usable, that's really hard to do. And that's what the Steph team was able to do over the last little bit. They took that crimson idea, which has been kicking around for a while now, and there is a usable uh, piece of code um, to be short there. It's a lot of pieces of code, but um, it's usable. You can download this with the reef release. You can build it. Don't ever use it for production. They made clear that it's not ready yet. We're a couple of releases away, but it's exciting to see how much progress happens so quickly in such a big novel new idea. And what's cool about this Crimson OSD is um, the way they're building it, they're using asynchronous programming in C++. They're using a library called CSTAR, which is, uh, it, I might, it, it's, it's kind of like, uh, I think, Future Promises, if you're familiar with JavaScript at all, that concept of like, uh, send a request off, and then I just get a kind of like ticket back saying, oh, I'm working on this, and then so the CPU can go do other things. So the idea there is that, um, um, well, you just should be able to reduce tail latencies and all kinds of great stuff with that NVMe. Now, the challenge of this and why it's really cool is if anyone's done asynchronous programming before, it's very hard to debug, and especially with something where you're going to use it as the underlying core of a storage cluster. You're going to want to make sure she's rock solid. So one, one of the talks we went to, it was an amazing talk about just the general principle of like how they're attacking this problem in Crimson and, and the concept of this asynchronous C++ programming. Um, and one of the questions afterwards was like, this is awesome, how do you guys debug it? And there was a, a, an audible laugh by everyone where, cause everyone was just aware of it's a challenge. But like anything cool in this world, you gotta do, you gotta, you gotta do something ambitious to really push it forward. So I think they're gonna build something really awesome there and uh, kudos to the team who took an idea to a prototype so fast. Okay, so of all the talks we went to, all the dev talks were really good. Um, I loved their insight of like what they're building and how they're building it. But the kind of the other side of the conference, because remember it's devs and users, and it's really cool to hear from the users, especially the ones presenting, because they're really kind of the forefront of massive clusters doing crazy stuff. We get to build some pretty cool clusters, but some of the talks I saw there, I look at those are like, whoa, like starstruck a little bit of, of the 
of what they're serving. For example, there was a couple people there from CERN, um, the, the particle collider. Um, uh, they've been using Ceph for years. They're, they're a main driver of where it is today too, but just listening to their experiences and the stuff they deal with there, it's just like, oh man, it's so cool. It's so cool to be able to sit there and be like, yeah, I, I, I work on the same stuff, kinda, that the CERN guys work on. Like, I don't know, personally, I always thought that was a really, uh, that was a badge, badge on or something. I don't know. It, and it comes back to the community thing again, where it's just like, we're all trying to do the same thing at the end of the day. Anyway, talks from all of them are really cool. Uh, Bloomberg Engineering was one of the um, uh, main sponsors. Um, I don't think they're platinum. They were one of the big sponsors of the talks. Um, and they did, uh, they did a bunch of talks. One in particular was really interesting. Um, was about them troubleshooting. They had to build a, a massive multi-site S3 cloud for use internal, internally, and uh, in prototyping phase, everything seemed fine, blah, blah, blah. And then as they scaled out and brought it to the thing, they just found bugs, missing objects and stuff like that. And they just did the whole talk of their journey through solving the problem, not even solving the problem, identifying the problem, chasing that ghost. Everyone's talk about solving something is the infamous, what I call chasing the ghost where you know something's wrong, but you can't make it happen repeatedly. And it drives you crazy because you have to fix it, but you're chasing a ghost. So step one in anything is make that ghost appear every time you want, then reduce it. And then, but it was, so it was just their whole experience. I was just sitting there like, oh, I'm so glad I got to hear it. But uh, some of the use cases on these clusters, my God, they're high performance. And Ceph just lives up to all of it. So whether, but, and that's the cool thing. You don't need to use Ceph for the best of the best. You can, because it's that awesome. But you can use it to just do your general business file sharing too. That's how versatile this product is. And again, open source community, you go and you talk and share all these things and you see, holy crap, this thing's powering our company's file server all the way to storing S3 objects that are coming out of a particle accelerator. Like, doesn't that feel cool? That's pretty cool. Um, so overall, like overall, it was just really fun to watch all those things, to learn their processes of how they solve things, take that stuff back and yeah. I guess I said it, but I'll say it again. Just, just be part of the community. It was fun to be there. Which leads me to my last point. The community in general. All the people we met there. Um, first day was almost a little overwhelming. I was sitting there listening to everyone, seeing faces. It was, I was like, ooh, I was almost scared. You know what I mean? Um, and then as it went on day two, we talked to some more people and really met some, some friends we had already and met some new friends. In particular, our, um, our friends at 42 On. They were one of the, uh, one of the sponsors. They, uh, they had... A, uh, well, they were sponsored because that's their home. They're, they're a Dutch company, and a lot of them are near or around Amsterdam. So um, they were there. Uh, we've met and worked with 42 on in the past. Awesome company, awesome group of people. Really align with, with our values as well, too. So love working with them. Uh, it was nice to, nice to see them. Uh, shout out to the Stroop Waffles. I'll try. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that exactly correctly, but they were the tastiest treats I've ever had. Um, I recommend you either go over to the Netherlands and get some or get the closest thing you can. Uh, it smelled like Cinnabon, if, uh, for, if, if you know what that is. It just, it, it, it drew you into the room. Anyway, so there was that. Um, yeah, whoa, well, M- M- Mikael, all the, all the guys there. Uh, Michelle, sorry. Um, I met, our, our, we met some friends at Thomas Kren. Uh, they were fans of our work. I was like, <laughs> Our work, your wiki, some of the best wikis out there. Like I've learned a lot from you guys, so that was cool, you know, to do that back and forth. And uh, and another friend of ours, Zach Dover, which we met for the first time there. I, he's he's the head of documentation uh, of the Ceph Foundation. Um, he was hilarious the way he carried himself on stage. I thought I was like, I gotta meet that guy. He's awesome. And luckily, he felt the same about us, and he was a big fan of the the videos and the content we put out here. So. Uh, um, we made a new friend there, so shout out Zach if you're watching. And um, I guess I'll just end with like, it was awesome to be part of the community. And if you're ever able to go to a conference like that, especially if you're an attendee as a student or something like that, if you're not going through business, I don't think you have to pay. And if you do, it's very small. So if you can go to an open source conference like that or anything like that, go, oh, you'll learn a lot. It's lots of fun. Um, so we had a great time and uh, can't wait to go back next year. Uh, I want to do a talk at it, but we'll see. We'll see what happens.